Welcome back, everyone, to part two of our look at the story of Friedrich der Grossa, Frederick the Great. Uh, we dove into this story for the first time yesterday. If you did not see part one of my reaction, there's a link in the description that will take you back to that so you can catch up. Also, a link to the original content from Extra History so you can check that out for yourselves. Also, whenever somebody makes a comment or offers a correction in case I maybe make a mistake or I get something wrong or there's additional information, I would encourage you anytime you watch one of my videos to check the, for any pinned comments. Uh, if there's a correction that needs to be made or additional information that I need to follow up on, I'll often pin a comment providing that information and that was the case with yesterday's video. Several of you offered some clarification on a more modern definition of how people view agnosticism versus atheism. So I thank you guys for that. Uh, and you can check that out on the previous video. Also, a couple of you pointed out correctly that Frederick the Great is the grandson of King George I of England. Uh, so another added layer to that, just how we know that they're all, all these royal families are related one way or another. But uh, George I of England was George of Georg of Hanover. He was German by birth. He did not speak English. Uh, and it was actually only his... Uh, great-grandson, King George III, who was the first king in the Hanover dynasty whose first language was English for, uh, for the kings of England. So interesting tidbit, but let's go ahead and dive into part two today, the School of Battle. The Rhine, April 1734. It's the War of Polish Succession, and Frederick, Crown Prince of Prussia, is trying to be the man his father wants him to be. Though court-martialed after his attempted escape to England, he's been restored to military rank in order to gain battlefield experience. But this is not how you run an army. Frederick is embedded with the forces of the Holy Roman Empire, confronting the French under the famed general, Prince Eugene of Savoy. Yet Eugene is a fated hero. He can pass wisdom and experience to Frederick, sure, but he's also 70, frail, and can barely remember his last conversation. He's cautious and defensive, afraid to act. So if I'm looking at this situation and not knowing what happens in this situation, I'm kind of anticipating and guessing. I'm guessing that the fact that you've got a weak, frail, indecisive leader who is past his prime uh, and you've got someone like Frederick who has a great deal of inherent authority because of who his father is, he, if he's a leader, he's going to probably see the vacuum in power here and he's going to step up and so this is going to create an opportunity not only uh, to be in a situation where he's supposed to be learning but maybe a situation where he's going to step into a power vacuum people who are naturally gifted as leaders will tend to do that uh, and i actually can remember a situation from my own life i'm, I'm someone who tends to like to t kind of take the lead if no one else is i'll fully recognize authority if it exists but when there's a power vacuum, somebody will tend to step into that. So, for example, when I was on a jury trial several years ago, uh, we the first thing we had to do when we went into the jury room to begin deliberations was to choose a foreman for the jury. And everybody's kind of just sitting around staring at each other. And I hate that kind of a vacuum of power. So I stepped up, I said, I stepped up and I just spoke up and said, OK, we need somebody who's willing to be the foreman here. And simply by speaking up like that, people immediately looked at me and thought, well, you should do it. And, and so we stepped into that. I stepped into that role. Uh, so I'm guessing that's what's going to happen here with Frederick. His body was still there, Frederick later observed, but his soul had gone. Hmm. And the Imperial Army, well, it was weak, disorganized, and fractious. Needed leadership. I could defeat this enemy, Frederick muses, and he would get his chance. For this terrorized prince was about to start a fire that would burn through Europe and the world. Say, would you happen to want to watch the next episode of this series immediately after watching this one instead of having to wait a full week? Well, now with the new Nebula First, you totally can. Learn how to get access through the Curiosity Stream Nebula Bundle after the episode. At the end of last week's episode, Frederick decided to play the role of the dutiful son. And, you know, wait until his ill father died. He submitted to a new regime of tutors that focused on making him masculine, agreed to marry a woman he detested, and went to war. But a strange thing happened. I'm curious, did he really detest her or was it just the idea of being married to a woman that he detested? Frederick actually became a pretty good soldier. 
As colonel of a regiment, he developed a fascination with strategy, battlefield tactics, and leadership. And while he never truly saw any action during the War of Polish Succession, he acquitted himself honorably. When he returned, his father, Frederick William, now confined to a wheelchair by gout, reconciled with his son. So, warfare and soldiering and things like that may not have been his first love, but if Frederick is the kind of person that I think he is, which is a person who is a learner, some of us are like that, right? We just love to learn. We're interested in things. And those that desire to learn doesn't have to only be confined to the things we're most passionate about. So I, I feel like anything he's going to do, he's going to do 110%. So that's what's happening here. Proud of Frederick's progress, he gave him a lakeside castle where he could indulge in artistic pursuits in private. Frederick and his wife, Elizabeth Christine, moved in, though in truth he largely kept clear of her. There, he read books, staged plays with friends, played the flute, set up a regular discussion group on military strategy, and recruited architects to expand his new home. It was the happiest time of his life though he was clandestinely doing something else as well, preparing to become king. See, some of those architects started quietly taking trips on his dime, studying opera houses in mm. Italy and France. He also immersed himself in philosophical writing, producing his first book, The Anti-Machiavel, an idealistic refusion of Machiavelli's The Prince. In the book, Frederick argues in favor of an enlightened absolutist monarch who would provide a moral example to his people and keep them healthy and happy. So he's basically writing what he sees himself capable of, right? He's he's saying this is what it looks like. And, and, and the fact that he has taken the time to think through what it means to be uh, an enlightened, benevolent, benevolent ruler means that he's already thinking about the kind of legacy he's going to want to leave himself. He then sent the manuscript to the French philosopher Voltaire, who edited it and prepared it for anonymous publication. Wow. Though his identity did leak immediately. It would eventually become a bestseller, with readers hoping to gain a window into Frederick's mind. This was a really common practice in those days, was for prominent people to write things anonymously or under a pseudonym. This happened often in the U.S. Uh, in the early days of the United States where uh, prominent people in government would write and they would take pseudonyms like a name of some famous Roman orator from thousands of years earlier. Uh, so I see that's happening here in Europe as well. And perhaps the greatest insights could be found in a section on the type of wars he considered just. It contains some of the things you'd expect, such as defensive wars or wars of last resort, but also what Frederick called wars of interest. In such a war, a king realizes an enemy is going to declare war on him in the future and preemptively attacks them in order to gain the greatest military advantage. Huh, was Frederick already... The early uh, origins of what will become very prominent in the late 18, early 1900s, uh, the idea of the cult of the offensive, the idea that it's better to have the initiative and to take the attack to the enemy rather than wait to see what he does to you. Already considering the moves he'd make during his reign? Well, it's possible. Though by this time, he had become adept at keeping people at a distance, hiding behind a series of masks and personas that sometimes contradicted one another. And more often than not, he adopted the part of a misanthropic loner. Some historians see this as a survival tactic, a response to trauma, huh. and an attempt to hide his sexuality. But it did mean that even for close friends and ministers, it was really difficult to get inside Frederick's head. So it's hard to say exactly how Frederick felt in May of 1740, when he got word that his father was dying. Rushing to the palace in Berlin, they had time for one last talk. And it turned out that while opposite on all else, their political ambitions aligned. Both dreamed of uniting the scattered territories of Brandenburg, Prussia, currently sprinkled through the Holy Roman Empire or embedded with Poland, and both thought their kingdom could be one of the great nations of Europe. Then, on March 31st, 1740, Frederick William died in the arms of the son he'd tormented. But Frederick hmm. wasn't left alone. For now, he had the most efficient bureaucracy in Europe, an unmatched recruitment system, an army of 80,000, and an enormous war chest of funds. So, for all the faults they had in their personal relationship, father and son, father has really set son up for success in terms of the, the nation that he's left to him, the infrastructure that he's left to him, the finances that he's left. 
Uh, and so now it is for Frederick to take that and see what next level he can take that to. An amount his father had amassed by avoiding foreign wars. The soldier king had, ironically, relied chiefly on clever diplomacy mm. and never fully used the army he'd built. King Frederick II, however, would. But Isn't that ironic that the king that starts out as the warlike one presides largely over peace and the one who didn't really have an affinity for the military early on is going to be the, the man of war? First, some fun. Frederick's immediate move after his father's death was to build an opera house. He wanted to invest in the arts and sciences, which, ironically enough, his father had defunded so badly that they actually had to borrow soloists from Saxony to sing at his funeral. <laughs> Next up, no longer requiring a wife to mollify his father, Frederick sent poor Elizabeth Christine to a palace outside Berlin. She wasn't even invited to his coronation. Wow. Instead, he brought an Italian philosopher who was likely his lover, and the pair followed it up with a foreign trip together where they met Voltaire. Then... With all of that out of the way, Frederick prepared for a war of interest. October 20th, 1740, Vienna. Charles VI, Holy Roman Emperor and sovereign of the Habsburg dominions, is dead. All his life, Charles had been terrified that he would only have daughters, and because the laws of the Habsburg dominion said women could not inherit, his scattered territories would fragment in a succession crisis when he died. To prevent this, he'd issued the Pragmatic Sanction of 1713 declaring that a woman could inherit the Habsburg lands, and he spent most of his reign trying to get his neighbors to agree to it. So isn't it interesting how many times in history people are all about the rules until the rules have the potential to hurt them, and then they're all about changing the rules to benefit themselves? Good thing, too, since his daughter Maria Theresa proved his most viable heir. Ironically, a woman Frederick tried to marry when he was searching for a bride. Now that'd be an alternate history novel worth reading. Charles had essentially bankrupted Austria in trying to bribe the great states into accepting the Pragmatic Sanction, a document they immediately backed off of as soon as he was dead. Austria's military was also weakened from a series of major wars, meaning the vultures were circling, seeing what they could pick off the Habsburg corpse. Of course, Austria also had something Frederick wanted, Silesia, a province that made up a third of Austrian revenue and sat right across the border from wow. Brandenburg. But Frederick needed to make his move soon. Way too long, and Saxony might take Silesia first, blocking Prussian expansion south. In six weeks, lightning speed in 18th century standards, Frederick had mobilized his army and crossed the border into Silesia. It was so easy at first, so much so, that he could not have imagined that this act would set in motion a chain of events that would bring bloodshed not just to Central Europe, but to places as far away as Senegal, Brazil, India, and the Philippines. A world war. I mean, you have several wars in the coming decades that you really could classify as a world war. You're going to have the Seven Years War, which is going to involve most of the major powers of Europe and be fought in North America as the French and Indian War. Uh, you know, in a lot of ways, the American Revolution is a two-continent war, two-hemisphere war. Uh, and of course, you have the Napoleonic Wars. The First Silesian War and the War of Austrian Succession had begun. Prussian forces were practically unopposed, sweeping up the lightly defended province and taking forts. But Maria Theresa, who would become Frederick's lifelong rival, raised an army and began to oppose him. Isn't it interesting that these two rivals, you've got a almost certainly gay man uh, leading Prussia and you've got a woman leading Austria uh, at a time when all that Frederick's father was concerned about was the virile, strong, alpha male type. It's pretty, pretty ironic. And so, Frederick II fought in his first battle. Mulwitz, April 10th, 1741. As the Austrian cavalry comes at his right flank, Frederick realizes his mistake. He'd tried to run this battle like an exercise, like he was drilling troops. When they'd come upon the Austrians, they could have simply charged into the smaller, unready army, but instead, he'd formed up, putting his grenadiers between his cavalry like the great Swedish king Gustavus Adolphus did in the Thirty Years' War, a formation that would let the infantry murder cavalry with shots before his own mounted troops could countercharge. A battle plan out of a history book. It isn't working. Instead, And that's a pretty common strategy that's going to be used up to and including the First World War. A lot of these generals in World War I uh, grow up in the army in a time when cavalry charges are still 
one of the big power plays that you have. The idea of using your infantry to create a, a gap in the line, to create a hole, to get a breakthrough, and then you send your cavalry through it to explo exploit that breakthrough. The Austrian horse crashes into the right wing of his army and envelops it. His cavalry are standing still when the charge connects. The units mix in a battle of swords and pistols. And Frederick's in the thick of the fighting. It's confused and bloody. Huh. There's driving snow and fog. And both sides have white uniforms. The Prussian infantry and artillery keeps firing into their own ranks, mistaking comrades for the enemy. And the Prussian cavalry are starting to rout. Oh, Gustavus Adolphus, he thinks. Oh god, this is how Gustavus Adolphus died. Mixed with the enemy, lost in fog. Suddenly, a man grabs his reins. It's his general. He tells Frederick to flee the field. The battle seems lost, and if he falls, Prussia will too, hmm. for he has no heir. So Frederick turns his great charger and bolts toward the nearest- He technically does have an heir. It would be his brother. Uh, and eventually it'll actually be one of his nephews, I believe, who will inherit the throne. It's town. And he doesn't see that behind him, while his cavalry has broken, the well-drilled Prussian infantry starts to move across the field like solid walls, firing in steady volleys, driving off the Austrian cavalry attack. It is Frederick's first battle, and he's running away. But his infantry, the great gift from his father, will stand and fight. Hmm. Oh man, Zoe, what a... Interesting. So uh, I'm curious to see how this is going to go. I didn't realize... Uh, how heavily involved Frederick is going to get. I mean, I knew there were wars that were happening, but I didn't know how much he was right on the front lines in some of these battles that were happening. So I'm curious to see where the story goes from here. We will be back with part three tomorrow. Definitely make sure you check it out. Thanks for watching.